Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's session entitled Macroeconomic Resilience, How Are Policymakers Responding to Current Macroeconomic Risks? My name is Gillian Tett. I'm the U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times in America, and I'm delighted to be involved in this panel today discussing this very, very key theme. I should say that one of the goals of the World Economic Forum is to promote inclusive democratic engagement. So I think we have this today with a layout. Not only are the ministers and officials outnumbered by the audience, but you're sitting behind them ready to pounce. So I think the balance of power in the room is quite unusual. But um, we're discussing a really very important theme right now, because those of you who read the Financial Times this morning, and I hope you all did, might have seen a story entitled at the top of our page, web page, Emerging Market Capital Outflows Eclipse Financial Crisis Levels. Apparently, there have been bigger net capital outflows over the later three quarters than during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And that reflects a very significant shift in sentiment, not just amongst investors, but also policymakers around the world. I was with Christine Lagarde and Janet Yellen yesterday in Washington. And as Christine Lagarde pointed out quite forcefully to Janet Yellen, um, there's been quite a rotation of risks in the world global economy, away from regulated banks to non-regulated, away from the developed world to the emerging market world. That, at least, is the IMS view. She wasn't talking specifically about Latin America, but many Latin American countries are being looked at increasingly cynically by international investors, not just because of concerns about what a change in Federal Reserve monetary policy would mean, not just because of the commodities, shift in the commodities climate, not just because of the slowdown in China, although, that, although that's certainly very important, but also because of big questions about whether the significant institutional reforms that happened a decade or, do, decade or two ago are slowing down. So the question is, has the remarkable renaissance we've seen run out of steam, or are you collectively going to be able to co uh, convince everyone sitting around you that actually Latin America is on track and can weather what's going to happen over the next year? So we have a terrific group of people to talk about this. On my immediate left, we've got Eric Parado, who's superintendent of banks and financial institutions of Chile. Next to him, a man who needs no introduction to this crowd, Luis Videgaray, Minister of Finance and Public Credit of Mexico. Opposite me, again, a man who doesn't need much interruption to this group, is Ricardo Villela Marino, Executive Vice President of Itao Unibanco Brazil, of Brazil, um, the region's largest bank. Over here, we have um, Mauricio Cardenas, who is Minister of Finance and Public Credit of Colombia. And on my immediate right is Ernesto Talvi, Academic Director, Centre for the Study of Economic and Social Affairs in Uruguay. So a mixture of ministers and commentators and a banker. So I'd like to perhaps to start by asking Minister Videgray, what can you tell international investors today who are concerned about whether Mexico is in a good position to weather future capital markets turbulence? Certainly the current environment, Gillian, uh, uh, and thank you very much for, uh, for hosting this, um, this, this panel in this um, nice and new format. And welcome, welcome to all to Mexico. Uh, certainly the, the international environment is, is challenging and it's going to challenge the resilience, the macroeconomic resilience of emerging markets all across the globe. Um, you, have, you have sluggish growth, falling commodity prices. Of course, for Mexico, the price of crude oil is very important. And then uh, we have shifts um, uh, almost of tectonic, tectonic proportion in monetary policy, where you see uh, the monetary policies of Europe and Japan going in one way, and US monetary policy um, will go in a, in a very different way. This is all creating shifts in capital allocation around the world. And this is, um, this is creating already volatility, and it's already testing the macroeconomic resiliency of all developing economies, all, all emerging markets, including Mexico. How are we dealing with this challenge in Mexico? We're basing our strategy in three concepts. First of all is liquidity. Second is uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, sound fundamentals. 
and third, structural reforms. Why is liquidity so important? Um, in times of stress, uh, uh, particularly currency markets, um, can, uh, can, can produce sharp movements not, not without uh, order and really reflecting um, the, the, the fundamentals of the market. So our main priority in, in the market for the Mexican peso is to make sure that the market works well, orderly, and with enough liquidity. We are not fixing the exchange rate. Mexico has a history of over 20 years with free-floating exchange rate. We, uh, we, we believe it's much better that the market uh, makes this, this happen. But um, our role as policymakers is to provide liquidity. We do that by having substantial, a substantial amount of foreign exchange reserves, um, over, uh, over 195 billion US dollars. And then on top of that, we have a flexible credit line with the IMF that was renewed just at the end of last year for another 70 billion US dollars. So we, are, we have substantial reserves, not for fixing the exchange rate or protecting a particular level, but for making sure that we have enough liquidity and the markets work well. Second is fundamentals. So just stop that. So you're basically saying that you stand ready to intervene in the foreign exchange markets if there is a wild burst of volatility again, if, 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 is, if the peso starts weakening dramatically. If there is a lack of liquidity, we are not stepping in to, to um, defend or to set a particular level. Uh, that is for the market to define. But we have intervened in the past. We set up a mechanism in January, in, in December. Now back in March, we did again. And we will continue to provide liquidity in order for the market to work properly. That's the first part. The second part of the three-part strategy is um, uh, sound fundamentals, sound macroeconomic fundamentals, um, credible monetary policy, a sound banking system, and particularly a credible path for fiscal policy, making sure that uh, our, our, our fiscal uh, deficit remains on track on a credible path and that we stabilize our debt to GDP ratio. We are, as an oil producing country that has uh, a significant part of our public revenue is depending on oil, we have cut our budgets um, earlier this year in January. We announced a 0.7% cut in the budget and uh, we, uh, we are working on the, already on the budget for next year that will also reflect the needs of um, uh, being more, uh, having tighter expenditures. And third uh, is the structural reforms. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a world where capital is going um, somewhere else, we need to provide a case, present a case that, it's, uh, it's, uh, that we continue to be an interesting investment spot. And there is no other way, there's no substitute for, for structural reforms. And I think Mexico has a very strong case uh, about structural reforms happening and becoming a reality. Well, I'm going to come back and talk about structural reforms in a bit, together with questions about the rule of law and the level of credibility of the judicial system later on. But I want to ask Minister Cardenas, um, when you look at the macroeconomic climate today in the markets, I mean, we've had people from the IMF warning about not just another taper tantrum, but possibly a super taper tantrum coming. Um, what are you doing to prepare for any taper tantrum, and how concerned are you? Well, thanks, uh, Julian. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, happy to see Minister Videgaray, who's been a long friend, and to be in your country, and to all the members of the panel. Um, five years ago, in 2010, there were a number of articles in the press talking about the decade of Latin America. And we're half through that decade. And I think during the first half, uh, we, all of us, were pretty much on the same wave of high commodity prices and low interest rates. Um, now the wave is fading. So it's now about swimming. Who knows to swim best? Um, we're not longer on that wave. Um, and to swim, to swim well, you have to be fit for that. Um, and there are a number of things that are necessary to be a good swimmer. Uh, one of them is to be lean and to be prepared and to have a good sense of direction, where you're going. Um, once the wave has passed, uh, not everyone is going to get to the coast at the same pace. Um, and I think it's going to depend a lot on your abilities. So let me put your question in that context. How well prepared are we to do that? And I think not everyone is equally prepared. Um, Colombia, for example, is a country 
that has managed to uh, reduce its fiscal deficit significantly. Its public debt to GDP ratio uh, has a very strong financial sector, um, has an economy that is not very dollarized on the country, um, and has an economy that at the same time uh, has run low inflation. So with that, you are well equipped to deal with this because you can depreciate the currency without worrying for other effects on inflation, on the balance sheet of banks or the corporate sector. That helps a lot. Um, and that's what we've done. The currency has depreciated and that's an automatic stabilizer. Um, are we concerned about increases in interest rates in the United States and uh, super... Uh, super taper tantrum. Taper tantrum. Uh, no, we're not. And the reason is that I think markets are discriminating. Markets understand what the fundamentals are. And, and markets are going to be looking at uh, the sources of growth of the different economies. Uh, and one key aspect here is, uh, is domestic demand. And in Colombia, we understood that high commodity prices and low interest rates were temporary. We always consider that as a temporary force. And we began preparing for the times like now when those forces were, were going to be receding, uh, encouraging more domestic investment in infrastructure, in housing, expanding the size of the middle class. So I think those are the engines that are going to allow us to keep our, right. our cruising speed. Well, um, the other version of the image of the wave that you used is a wonderful um, image of your wonderful phrase that when the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming without any trunks. Um, which I don't know how you translate that in Spanish, maybe. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's you know, another version of what you're saying, that basically when the wave of, of high commodity prices and cheap money and Chinese demand, the three Cs, I like to say, cheap money, Chinese demand, and high commodity prices, as that wave recedes, you can indeed see where different countries are structurally. I mean, one of the countries which is considered to be looking quite naked, if I dare say it, as the tide goes out right now, is Brazil. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of concern about what the state of Brazil is in terms of the institutional reforms. You've had significant political protests. You have questions around the current government um, and, of course, corruption scandals. Um, what can you say to investors who are looking at Brazil today, either your bank or the country more generally, to reassure them? Actually, as you described, it's a pretty challenging uh, scenario and situation that we're facing right now in Brazil. But if I can say something, one phrase is, don't bet against Brazil. But uh, we should see that in a different perspective and in, in the context what's going on in the region and globally as well. And this new global environment uh, in the horizon, we see the US, it is about to uh, start the monetary tightening cycle sometime uh, by the end of this year. And commodity prices, was, as mentioned, are set to remain at low levels that we are forecasting. And for the Latin American countries, that will be very challenging and a risky environment ahead overall. Because as the US interest rate rise, we're going to see bond price becoming less attractive, liquidity uh, more expensive. Uh, what won't see this cheap credit so it won't exist anymore. And Latin American countries will face tighter external financial conditions. And at the same time, commodity prices are low with no recovery uh, in the horizon and no longer tailwinds uh, for growth in the Latin American region. We're going to see also uh, the region facing a less favorable terms of trade. But given that, uh, the, given that the global environment is riskier and uh, the question is for, for the panel and for ourselves, are, are Latin American countries prepared for a sudden capital outflows that you mentioned in the beginning of the conversation or to a lower prices and higher volatility in commodities? And uh, I dare to say that indeed uh, more than in the past. And why? Uh, because many countries, and not all, it's not homogeneous Latin America, in the region uh, have made most of the good times to build buffers. And just to mention three, important lines that were being uh, worked out with uh, responsible policymakers, some of them around this table, 
is that first, external positions uh, have become more resilient. Second, uh, the public debt has been reduced uh, over time and its composition is also healthier. And third, the inflation targeting, was, as was mentioned here before, the regime has been successfully implemented. But in the case of Brazil, in this uh, con uh, context, uh, I would say that uh, given the overall better economic uh, macro fundamentals, there is room for, uh, to face this challenging environment with counter-cyclical policies, especially true in countries such as Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, coincidentally the countries in the group of the Pacific Alliance, mm -hmm. I think in the case of Brazil it's not so accurate. And uh, we are in urgent need uh, for economic adjustment and to uh, prevent uh, policymakers from using both the fiscal and monetary policy as counter-cyclical uh, tools. And unlike other Latin American countries, uh, we see Brazil that didn't invest enough well, we had a favorable uh, commodities price cycle in, in, our, in our side. And we failed to recognize at that time the end of the cycle in time, which led to several imbalances that need to be tackled uh, to restore confidence and to allow a rebound of growth. And in Brazil, we are, as we speak right now, at the peak of the adjustment season. And that's the good news. We have uh, Minister Levy, which is working hard technically and politically to approve a lot of the adjustments that are necessary. I'll just mention quickly five. The fiscal one, the quasi-fiscal, uh, the regulated prices, a balance of payments, and inflation targeting. On the fiscal, as you know, it compromised the fiscal uh, primary surplus that we need to reach the target and move from minus 0.6% to the target of 1.2%. We won't believe our economies will reach this 1.2, but will be closer to 0 0.8, which is uh, homework done. Uh, we have to improve the debt dynamics of the country also and do this as a main adjustment in order to regain credibility and to enable uh, economic recovery. The second one, the quasi-fiscal reserve, uh, reserves to uh, public sector credit as well as ex expenditures uh, of budget. The third one is the prices. As we know, government set prices in gas, uh, electricity, they are repressed in the recent past and are lagging vis-a-vis -vis the other prices. So we see high uh, you know, increase in tariffs, 45% in electricity. And the third one is the balance of payment. It's an effort to reduce the current account deficit for the current more than 4% to a level in, uh, lower than 2.5% of GDP. And we see that at central bank perspective, the end of the daily intervention program uh, and also the strong exchange rate depreciation that we've seen in Brazil are part of their adjustment. Finally, on the fifth point, inflation target, we must renew the efforts to reach the inflation target of 4.5%. Nowadays, this year, as we forecast, we're going to end with inflation over 8%. So very challenging, all the adjustments, but necessary, and little by little, we're gaining confidence to go through the, the deep levels of the cycle, because at the end of the day, we cannot lower the guard Otherwise, we're going to be caught naked when the tide goes down. <laughs> well, it's certainly a radically different position to the situation five years ago when Indeed. the Brazilian finance minister was talking about currency wars. But, I mean, one of the questions that is particularly concerning people in Washington, many investors, is institutional reform or institutional change and whether that's run out of steam or not. Um, I'm looking at Eric Parado to ask, really, in terms of the banking sector, I mean, Chile, in many ways was widely mm -hmm. admired for the reforms you did introduce in previous years in the financial sector. Do you think that the pace of institutional reform is slowing down, not just in Chile, but elsewhere? No, I don't think so. Um, but let's try to, to put this in context, given that we are in, in Playa del Carmen, I would say that the sunny days are over in, in Latin America in, in some way, um, and some countries did the, the homework and some countries didn't. Mm. Uh, that meaning that the, the sunny days includes all the aspects related to high commodity prices, cheap money, uh, huge liquidity, and, and some countries took advantage of that. Mm. Some countries bought hats, coats, umbrellas, mm -hmm. uh, and some countries didn't. And that's the, the, the main difference between uh, Pacific Alliance countries and other type of countries. 
And on the financial system, uh, I would say that Chile made a lot of reforms uh, previously, at least on, on the banking side. But now, this year, we're in the middle of uh, changing uh, the, banking, the banking law. Uh, because we said it has worked, but we have to make changes to uh, diminish the gap between the international standards and our own standards. When the global crisis hit us, the economy uh, in Chile was really well prepared. I would say, without trying to compete with all other countries, we were the most resilient country in Latin, Latin America. Why? I would say because of our, of our economic policy framework with a countercyclical fiscal policy, we save a lot in the sunny days, to spend a lot in the rainy days. We have a very countercyclical monetary policy too. During the global crisis, uh, the, the Central Bank of Chile reduced uh, 800 basis points in one shot, in one year with a flexible exchange rate, which acts as a buffer. Third, high international reserves. And fourth, a very well and strong regulated financial system. So a combination of these four legs have implied financial stability. But having said that, we have to continue doing all the economic reforms that uh, countries need. Last year, we passed uh, a huge tax reform. It was over uh, almost 3% of GDP to finance a huge educational reform. But at the same time, we are in the process of changing some laws to have institutional, uh, institutional change in the, in the law uh, to improve transparency in political activities, for instance. It, it has become an issue in Chile. So it's not only talking about economic uh, laws and reforms, but also about institutional reforms that all countries need. And at the end of the day, we want to attract investors. And that's the, the whole idea of doing these reforms. Right, right. So you are one of the few people out of this group who doesn't have any direct responsibility for running anything. You're commenting at the moment. Um, how credible do you find these arguments? <laughs> So I hold the key for credibility. Oh. <laughs> exactly. So you're allowed to speak I mean, relatively freely at the moment. So what, 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 what to, marks would you give, give to each to of them? If I had to give you an answer in one word, given the countries that are represented in this table, I would say that I find what they are saying very credible. So on your, on your two opening questions, um, is Latin America prepared for a super paper tantrum and lower commodity prices and less than supersonic uh, growth rates in China? The answer is, it depends. We don't have one, but three Latin Americas. Yeah. So we have, the first one is uh, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru. Uh, the outward looking, faster growing, uh, and with very sound financial indicators. I mean, these countries have huge levels of liquidity in relation to short-term debts coming due, which is what, what, what Minister Videgaray was referring to when he said, we are liquid, so if the market suddenly close, uh, we can always have our own resources. I mean, all these countries are in good terms with the international community, so they will be able to tap on international land of last resort facilities with the IMF. Um, Brazil, uh, let's say Argentina and Venezuela, I mean, we all know. I mean, they are already in crisis mode, so nothing to elaborate there. Well, since, they're not, uh, <laughs> since they're not represented and they don't yeah. have a voice, unless anyone in the audience wishes to comment. I don't want to continue <laughs> uh, talking. And, and Brazil, I think what people underestimate, Brazil, has not been so far as that outward looking as the other countries. It has some real limitations in infrastructure and other limitations that we know of. But, but um, the liquidity position of Brazil and the soundness of the financial system, we actually performed in a Brookings Series report last October some stress tests for all these countries. 
uh, for the banking system. And this is amazing how large uh, non-performing loans have to go up in order for uh, these banks to start having problems. They are extremely resilient in terms of the capital and the provisions that have, they have already made for non-performing loans. So I think that the narrative of the people who are sitting in this table is, is it looks good to me. Now, we don't have the international community sitting at, at this table, and it is as important as these countries if we are going to have anything even remotely similar to a super tapered tantrum. I mean, the IMF has to be ready to perform uh, the functions of international lender of last resort. It has to have the ability to act rapidly, decisively, uh, unconditionally, with sizable amounts to deal with the problems, to avoid fundamentally sound countries from having any problems. That's the IMF. And at the level of the World Bank, and this is a message I would like to, to share with my Latin American colleagues, we need to be careful this time around not to react instinctively as we did in the past. We need to look good vis-a-vis -vis financial markets. So we have a slowdown. Fiscal uh, balances start to look uh, not as good as they looked before. So we start immediately taking austerity measures. I think we have to go to a mode of what I like to call intelligent austerity. This is a world of super low interest rates. If we can take advantage of those very low rates to invest in infrastructure, to invest in human capital, to invest, as my friend Ricardo Hausmann likes to say, uh, uh, in uh, rekindling access of informal workers into the uh, uh, complex networks that will allow them to increase their productivity. We can all, if we can do that, those are socially profitable investments. If we are borrowing at zero or close to zero, then uh, that should not be counted as debt. And for in present years, value terms, yeah. it is not. So we should be careful in not overdoing it with austerity <coughs> because the world we live in is not the same as the one we had in the 80s or the 90s. But Minister um, Vitegaray and Cardenas, I mean, are you convinced that if you engage in intelligent austerity, the markets will give you the benefit of the doubt? Well, in I'm, the case I'm, of Mexico, if I, if I may, Mauricio, in the case of Mexico, we are... I mean, are, of course, you're, you're facing, what, is it 42% of your budget you know, has you know, it's vanished a, from the oil price uh, and falling? It, overall, it's 30%, but that's but offset. That's 30%. It's 30%, but that's offset because we also import gasoline. Uh, so we have... Uh, the, 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 true, the net impact is, is much uh, lower, but still, it's significant and we need to react. The, we, why we are uh, about the budget cuts, uh, I'd say two things in, in uh, reacting to Ernesto's uh, comment. First, um, we are sticking to our budget deficit uh, target. So we are, we are cutting our budget because we have less money and in order to not to have a larger deficit. So we are, we, we, but we are not reducing our target. We're sticking to our target. But that means we have to reduce expenditure. But it's also important how we do it. And we have a lot of room to cut a current expenditure in things. For, for instance, uh, payroll uh, expenditure uh, uh, in the first quarter was reduced 2% uh, from the pre previous, um, from previous year. So we, if we focus not in reducing things that actually uh, create economic development, such as infrastructure spending or, 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 the, or social programs that are truly effective, but we focus on those things that governments can do and should cut because it's not working, then it, uh, I think it's a good message for the investment community. I just want to say something about the um, lowering of the, of, of the waves and, and uh, losing your trunks. In, exactly. in, the case of, <laughs> in, in, in the case of Mexico, uh, it's also important uh, where we are in the world. And that, that creates, um, uh, as Marisa was saying, uh, once the tide, well, once you're not riding the wave, but you're actually swimming, it's important uh, where you are. And Mexico is in a very strong place. We are part of North America. And uh, we are uh, an 80% of 85% of our exports are manufacturing. Uh, most of our exports go to the U.S., and that's clearly a different position from other emerging markets. Um, I, I strongly believe North America, and particularly with the energy reforms happening and and and, and the ener and, and the low cost of energy, makes uh, Latin America, I'm, I'm sorry, North America can be the fastest growing region for the next 10 years. So you believe that America, North America, is going to be the fastest growing region. Over the next 10 years. In the next I, think 10 years. It, I think that's a bad bet. Right. Well, that certainly will go down well in Washington. Um, but um, 
What do you think about trying to engage in intelligent austerity? I've never yet heard the World Bank champion intelligent austerity, but what do you think about that? Well, I, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, I tell my, my daughters, I say to them, one thing is to be intelligent, another thing is to feel intelligent, but yet another more important thing is what your grades say. So who's grading us and who's uh, basically looking at uh, what we do in terms of austerity? Um, Colombia has a fiscal rule. And the fiscal rule we have established that uh, for this year, for example, our fiscal deficit structural um, has to be 2.2% uh, of GDP or less. Um, so someone thought that that was intelligent. Um, the fiscal rule, by the way, is, uh, is well designed so that in a year like this, when you have low commodity prices and we're in a transition, uh, it allows for additional expenditures, the temporary adjustments. So say 0.6% of GDP on top of that. Is that sufficiently intelligent, or should we take advantage of the fact that there is money out there in the world available at low, a very low cost, and maybe we should run a 3 4% of GDP deficit? Um, I go back to what I say to my daughters. It depends on who's grading us. <laughs> and well, and, and the, the rating agencies are giving us very good ratings. Investors community are giving us very good ratings, uh, essentially because we're sticking to our fiscal rule. Should we relax that? I, I wouldn't want to test that. I wouldn't like to do that, because I think credibility is a very important part of this game. And, um, and sticking to your rule, um, I think, is, uh, is, is the best option we have. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it, because it could be intelligent from your own point of view. I mean, you could do more things. You could uh, offset some of the declining commodity prices. You could stimulate the economy further. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, it's about who grades you. I can see you're dying to protest. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not going to protest. Uh, to my friend Mauricio, I, I fully understand uh, the position a minister is in, and I would be saying exactly the same if I were in Mauricio's uh, place, but that you don't want to test the limits of credibility. But uh, and the, the way you are graded is not ingrained in stone. Our, our role from the public policy research community is to try to change the way people think about how they grade us. And uh, that is why I think the international financial organizations maybe will have a renewed role to play, just as they played in the 50s and the 60s when uh, they were the only game in town in terms of capital flows. We didn't have private, but official flows or multilateral flows. So they can be part of the uh, recycling of these resources into socially productive uh, investments that are being audited, in a sense, by and guaranteed by these multilateral organizations. And maybe uh, if they are not counted as actual deficits, and this is accepted by the community, then um, your deficit would not change, and you would be allowed to do productive, growth-promoting, productivity-enhancing investments. Well, certainly infrastructure has become the new favorite magic word if not um, would-be magic wand of the IMF and World Bank at the moment. I mean, everyone loves to talk about infrastructure. But um, Eric, what do you think about... Um... No, let me kick in, in the discussion regarding uh, austerity. Because I think austerity, I, I'm not sure if we, we can use well that concept. I prefer to use the concept of fiscal responsibility, uh, fiscal rules, uh, and so on. For instance, in the case of Chile, we have a very strict fiscal rule that focus on the long-term price of copper. So independently of the current price, we only focus to get our expenditures on the long-term price of copper. So if the long-term price of copper is under this long-term of, uh, of copper, we have to supplement uh, those expenditures. 
And I think that's important because all countries that did the homework and saved money during the, the boom, during the super cycle boom of the commodities, now they have some sort of security, some sort of savings to spend it in the rainy days. And I think the investors discriminate that. And they look at the country and say, you know what? Those countries save a lot of money. So if they are running a deficit, a fiscal deficit, that probably we will have, of course, we can get all the money that we can without being shy and spending a lot. We did that during the global crisis. And we spent more than $9 billion, which is huge for our economy, trying to support the, the heat from the, the foreign uh, shocks. So that's, that's quite important. And I think if we uh, take uh, our current situation, more or less it's, it's a similar thing. Right. I'm I'm take one comment on the austerity again before we move to the subject. Um, uh, the sound, Mike. yes. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? No. Can no? somebody fix the sound, please? Hello? That's better, yes. Nice yes, uh, my comment is uh, that austerity stand alone doesn't matter how intelligent it might be. It won't bring, bring prosperity. Austerity is necessary, but it is not sufficient. We need to find other sources of uh, growth uh, for our countries to innovate, to be more productive, and so on. Take the case of Brazil. It would be quick on the example of Brazil, where we have fiscal imbalances uh, going on. And Brazilian economy urgently needs uh, adjustments to recover sustainable growth uh, down there. And uh, the main adjustment, as I was talking before, is, is the fiscal one because the primary surplus uh, has been deteriorated over the years because we haven't been doing the austerity homework correctly. Just to give you some numbers, uh, the primary surplus was 2.9% of GDP in 2011, came down to 2.2% of GDP in 2012, down to 1.8% of 2013, and minus 0.6% last year. So that came from an impact of uh, economic slowdown uh, on tax collection, uh, especially, it doesn't grow, we don't have tax collection and so on, and more expansionary uh, fiscal stance, uh, given the lack of uh, austerity. Ex ex uh, expenses were growing at a rate of 5.2%, so flat revenues, growing expenditure, not a very good equation. And uh, the reduction on the primary surplus and increase on the government uh, financing costs put a lot of pressure on the public debt. Just to give an example, the debt, net debt uh, of Brazil as a percentage of GDP increased from 2.6% in 2014 to 34%. And gross uh, debt increased from 5.6% to 59%. Uh, so given our calculations, our economists uh, at the bank, I'm surrounded by PhD in economics. In Brazil, we learn to become a PhD by force, by crisis. Uh, hyperinflation, debt crisis, and so on. We all pitch this uh, in Brazil. <laughs> the primary surplus uh, necessary in order to stabilize public debt long term is around 2.5% of GDP, which is much higher than the current one. Just to, to show that we need a lot of homework in the austerity front, but it's not sufficient right. to get the so-called prosperity. Well, I'm going to turn to the audience for questions in just a minute, because we have a lot of people in the room. We have a packed room. Um, a lot of people with a lot of experience. Um, I should say, by the way, that if any of you are feeling very shy and don't want to ask a question in public, you can email me a question too to futurefinance at wef.ch. So if any of you are too shy to put your hand up, you can email me in secret too. Um, <laughs> you can too if you'd like. <laughs> can I say a word? Abs please do, yes. Because Ernesto's point is right. There is cheap capital available. And, and that's something very exceptional about these times. So you could think, well, why don't you spend more at the level of the government and do it in a coordinated way with the rating agencies, <coughs> the multilaterals, etc. I think there is another way of doing the same thing, but more effective, which is have the private sector, have the private sector use that cheap capital create the incentives for the private sector to really take advantage of that opportunity. That's exactly what we're doing in Colombia with the uh, PPPs on uh, transport infrastructure, uh, road concessions, which is essentially a program where the private sector goes out there to the financial markets 
to borrow long-term, low-cost, build infrastructure, get some support from the Colombian budget, again, long-term, but we're going to maximize investment in the short term. And, and that's an alternative that allows you to stick to your fiscal rule, show that your fiscal performance is, is bright, but at the same time, you take advantage of, my, of uh, market conditions in the financial markets today. And I think that's perhaps an even more intelligent austerity. Are you convinced? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I'd, like to, I'd like to put a, um, a word on the austerity debate. I was reading a piece by Paul Krugman, who was my, uh, he was my professor at MIT, um, on the context of the, of the UK election about austerity, which is a big topic of debate. And uh, certainly, uh, perhaps the developed world has overdone austerity a bit. And I think uh, Krugman's uh, uh, point goes right through. Uh, because the orthodox response uh, to an output gap is not austerity, but to, to, to have a more relaxed fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, but to, after I read this uh, long piece, and, and intelligent piece by Paul Krugman, I, I, I thought, well, there's a, there's a difference between, uh, a fundamental difference between a country like the UK or an emerging market. What's, uh, what means being an emerging market is that you have to earn the trust of the markets every day. Um, you have to earn, in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a world that is, you have the constant risk, and particularly these days, of capital not flowing anymore into your country. You have to earn it. And the only way to earn it at the end of the day is confidence. Building confidence and building trust in that your monetary policy, your fiscal policy, uh, will remain on track. And that, in a, a, that goes not to the state of debate, but much more, as Eric was saying, on the fiscal responsibility uh, 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 debate. And I think uh, many of the Latin American countries, certainly, certainly the Pacific Alliance, Brazil is doing it as well, we are on track of preserving and strengthening uh, confidence in our fiscal trajectory. I mean, the other problem, of course, is that when you do get um, other difference between many emerging market countries and some of the developed countries, is that when you do impose austerity, you don't just get protest at the ballot box, you can get protest out on the streets. And of course, we're talking about a region with plenty of political volatility. Um, how concerned are you about the current political fragmentations and tensions um, in Brazil? We're following very closely what's going on um, socially and politically in the countries. It's a trend that it's not specific from Brazil. It's a trend that you see in other countries in the world where citizens, the civil society, is not happy with the, the prices and service quality of the public goods that they're receiving from government. And that's very natural for a mature democracy, such as uh, Brazil, when you have very solid uh, institutions that guarantee also the going forward uh, of the country. And we've been uh, witnessing in many capitals of, of Brazil millions of young people, liberal professionals, mid-class, different uh, races, uh, the diversity going into the streets to fight for this uh, better quality of goods and services, and plus uh, the end of corruption uh, in, in, our, in our country. So that's a, a claim, and the government, I think, it's uh, processing uh, this, this information, because uh, at the end of the day, they are the voters, they are the clients, and they need to be satisfied. So what kind of reforms that we're going to see going forward to approve, to have a better education, security, health, health plan for the country, so make sure that every tax dollar will go back in some way to benefit society at large. Right. Well, the, oh, the, I, the question of corruption and the judicial the credibility of the judiciary is obviously pretty critical right now in terms of investor confidence. But I'm going to turn to the audience for questions. Apparently, um, you're supposed to send questions if you do want to send them by um, social media rather than talk and uh, speak them to um, via Twitter. You have to use the hashtag future finance. That's how you send a question by Twitter if you would like to. Um, but let me start by asking whether there's anybody who'd like to ask a question in person. I'm sure there'll be plenty. Um, it would be um, courteous, but not compulsory, to identify yourself. And under no circumstances, and this is compulsory, no long speeches. I'm going to cut you off after 30 seconds, because we have five people and a lot of people in the room. So. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move here because it's for Minister Videgaray, but uh, I am Mauricio Garcia from Mexico. And I love that li liquidity comment. Uh, but uh, what about uh, local liquidity? liquidity in Mexico. I am amazed about 
the only uh, theme that goes around from entrepreneurs to big companies in this forum is the lack of, for example, VAT return for companies. And that is getting a lot of liquidity outside of enterprises' hands. So what about local liquidity and how can we solve that big problem that enterprises and I guess the whole country is facing right now? Thank you. Well, thank you for your comment. They, certainly, the, uh, one of the challenges when the when you're not riding the, wave, the external wave anymore, is to have a more robust domestic demand, just as Mauricio was saying at the beginning. And uh, if you look at the figures for the first quarter, uh, either you look at consumption, the sales of cars uh, in the domestic market, um, uh, supermarket sales, uh, these are certainly trending up. And that is a good sign that, uh, that families and even companies have more, more money in their pocket. Um, inflation is trending down. Um, uh, job creation is even stronger than the rate of, the, of economic growth, and that is, the, that is creating a foundation for consumption growth. Um, on, the, on, the, on, the very, on the specific topic you, you're, you're saying, um, when we started the administration, um, VAT collection was growing at a 4% rate. Uh, VAT returns were growing at over 20%. That meant that there's something was, was not right in the system. Uh, what we did is we took um, special steps in order to, to double check every every uh, every return of VAT, uh, but we're very much that, that process is very much be, behind us. Um, if you if if you look at manufacturing, if you look at, uh, at the food industries, which are the bulk of, of VAT returns, um, certainly the problem is very much uh, uh, very much corrected. But we are in the process of stabilizing, and um, just look at numbers of the in the in the, in the quarterly the first quarter uh, public finance report. Look at the figure for VAT collection. Um, that shows negative growth. Why is that? It's because we are returning a lot of the over two uh, VAT from last year. So, so the, the aggregate figures already show it, and particularly talking to manufacturers, you, you, you perceive that. Thank you. We have a question right behind me. Thank you. Uh, hi, Merdila. I'm the president of General Motors for Latin America. Uh, I wanted to go back to the issue of structural reforms. Uh, it seems like when times are good, you don't need them, and when times are bad, you can't afford them. And uh, what I wanted to say is, particularly with regard to tax reform and labor reform, there are very few countries that are really addressing those two seriously, and frankly, the ones that are, like in the case of Chile, seem to be going in the wrong direction, to be perfectly honest. Uh, what are countries doing in that regard, and how important is it in the agenda of the countries represented here those two that I think are very important for business, tax reform and labor reform. Who would like to address that? Uh, let me tell you what we've done and what we plan to do. Uh, what we've done is that um, three years ago, in 2012, uh, we decided to cut payroll taxes because we thought payroll taxes were really constraining formal employment. Um, so we decided to do that, and the results have been very positive. We cut payroll taxes that in Colombia were very high, 30% to half of that. And uh, since then, we've seen uh, 7 to 8% annual growth on formal employment, which is very important. Um, on taxes, I think this is a common question and a theme that it's all over in, in Latin America. And, uh, um, here's the tension. Most of our countries have relatively low tax collections, tax to GDP ratios, but yet the corporate sector has high income tax rates. And, and that's the world that is a little bit, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's contrasting. Um, the way to solve that and the way we're thinking in the future to deal with this issue is uh, by reducing tax evasion, by widening the tax base, by reducing informality, but making sure that you can spread uh, taxes over uh, you know, a, a larger set of uh, taxpayers. I think that's, that's the strategy we're following, and we are now in the middle of a debate uh, with the tax experts, with the tax commission, looking our, at our tax code to deal with that situation. Right. Ernesto, are there any countries out of here which impress you in terms of their Tax policies? Um, I don't share the idea that, that um, 
that uh, structural reform, uh, that the time for structural reform never is never ripe. I mean, I agree that in, when the external <coughs> environment is very favorable and you are doing well anyhow, so why get into the political cost of doing very costly uh, structural reforms if you are doing well anyway? When we are in crisis mode, we are basically devoting our, all our time and resources to repair balance sheets. So we are not in the mode of doing structural reforms. But this, I mean, excluding something exploding somewhere. I mean, here we are running into mediocre times where people lost the sense of a bright future that they had just a few years ago. And that's the reason why we are seeing that malaise among the electorate that's being expressed through, through spontaneous social protests. I really do think it is these times, just to paraphrase uh, a very famous economist, when the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. These are the times in which we can really tackle uh, structural reforms, and that's why I think it is so important, I mean, to try to take advantage of, in the way Mauricio suggested or, or otherwise, of these very, very, very low interest rates and abundance of resources. Let us have some historical perspective here before we are too, too sh sh uh, harsh on us. I mean, 35 years ago, 1980, most of the continent had military dictatorships everywhere. Not a single country in the continent, not a single country had single digit inflation. Um, we were jumping from crisis to crisis, from coup d'etat to coup d'etat. That, that's our, that was our reality. Today, most of the continent, as imperfect as it might be, uh, understands that elections are the only way to choose our leaders. Most of the countries in the continent, except two that I won't mention, have single digit inflation. Uh, 35 years ago, that would have been unimaginable. Unimaginable. So why not forward fast 35 years from now and think that maybe, maybe these times, these trying times that we are going to confront are the times in which Latin America will do what it takes to get into definitely the path of, of, of inclusive growth. Luis, Very shortly. Sounds like you should be employing Ernesto to do your public speaking for you. Very, uh, actually, that's, that's, that's a very strong insight. Uh, but very shortly, the question, do you do structural reforms uh, at what time in the business cycle? When you're up or when you're down? That's a wrong question. You, you should do reforms at the beginning of the political cycle. Do it, uh, if we learn anything in Mexico, do it immediately after the election, and don't think about the political uh, of the business cycle because reforms are not aggregate demand, short-term tools. These are structural reforms. The effects will be will come in five years, ten years, twenty years. So forget a little bit about business cycle. Um, act on the political cycle on structural reforms. Right. We have a question over there. Yes. I think we have a microphone. Do we? Yes. Okay. Oh, I think that. Um a question that I would like to, to hear the panel or give their opinion about is what do they think about the uh, uh, law and, and the relevance of, of, of the rule of law in, in, in our countries? And then the second thing that is... Uh, just, I think just one, because we're almost out of time. Okay. Rule of law. A rule of law. That yes. would be and great. we've got another question behind you. Let's just take a couple of questions, because we are, I think, yeah. Yeah, actually, I'm interested in uh, uh, hearing the panel talk about poverty. We've made enormous advances over the past 25, 35 years. We still have a 50% poverty rate throughout the region, more or less. And I want to see how intelligent austerity, fiscal responsibility tie in with solving that enduring problem. Okay. Well, we have a very engaged democracy here of lots of people trying to ask questions. I'm going to take one more over here, and then I think we'll probably have to treat that, sadly, as um, the final... I would like to ask a question to Ernesto Talvi. Uh, you haven't been, there's no representation here from Venezuela or Argentina in the, in the panel, uh, but, and they say that uh, no, uh, only barbers 
we learn on other people's heads, but what are the lessons about the do's and don'ts of economic policy that the region should learn from Argentina and Venezuela, maybe on multiple exchange rates, maybe on using price controls as a way of bringing inflation down and so on? Right, well, we have exactly five minutes, which by my maths gives you each about just under a minute to talk. So, Ernesto, do you want to start there? In, yeah. in one minute. Rather than getting into the, the technicalities of the lessons, Ricardo, I think uh, that the, the big lesson from Argentina and Venezuela is that state capitalism, you can afford it when you have very high commodity prices. Redistributed clientelistic policies can be afforded only when you have very high commodity prices and very cheap capital. Uh, it runs out of steam. So uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen in Venezuela, but I'm sure because Venezuela has a larger institutional problem, not only an economic problem. Argentina still has functioning, although imperfectly, institutions. And it's going to have an election. So Christina Kirchner can afford uh, essentially um, maintaining her position because she has a few months to go. But the next government can't, will, won't be able to afford state capitalism and redistribution, and we are going to see whoever wins very substantial change. Right. So you have to look, as Mauricio said, uh, you have to have very clear where to go, and, and, and state capitalism doesn't work. I'd like to ask a question about rule of law to um, Luis, Minister Vizagray. Um, because there is concern about the impartiality of the judiciary in Mexico. Um, can you convince people that the rule of law does actually operate in Mexico today? Well, certainly we, we have a large extent of a functioning uh, rule of law. In, uh, and uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why we are able to attract substantial investment, uh, for both foreign and domestic investment. Um, uh, the auto sector, General Motors announced uh, late last year, um, a five billion um, investment in Mexico for the next four years. And uh, we are constantly attracting um, capital from around the world, not only to financial markets, but direct investment. And that is because um, uh, people who invest in Mexico feel that there's, a, 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 there's protection, uh, there's contractual protection uh, to their investments. Of course, we have a challenge. And we have to, and the way we've chosen as a path uh, is to, to make better institutions. Either uh, the president just published, uh, signed and published um, this week uh, a new transparency law. Um, the Congress has approved a constitutional amendment uh, for anti-corruption, um, uh, a, a new system for anti-corruption. So yes, we need to work every day, and that has, has to be uh, the highest priority, to make a more robust um, rule of law state. Uh, and that's the path, the path we've chosen through institutional change. Right. Corruption or poverty? Can I take a question on poverty? Okay, <laughs> rather than corruption, absolutely. I, I, it's, a, it's a great question, and I think it's a question that matters to all of us here, government, academia, business. Because, um, and I'll go back to my analogy of the wave. You know, waves tend to get bigger and bigger at, at some stage, and that's exactly what happened with the, the expansion of the middle class, the reduction in poverty. So everything was working in the same direction. High commodity prices, low interest rates, and the middle class was growing, and that was part of these spectacular, say, last decade in the region. The expansion of the middle class, or the reduction in poverty, to a large extent, was supported by the government. It was the government that was behind that. Conditional cash transfers, all kinds of programs that really helped the poor, and I think that was uh, general in the region. With the um, less, uh, fiscal revenues because of the reduction in commodity prices. I mean, as there is less exuberance in terms of government expenditures, um, there is always that risk and there's always that challenge. What do we need to do now? We need to make sure that we continue reducing poverty and expanding the middle class based on jobs. This is really about jobs. That's really what could sustain the expansion of middle class in the long run. And that goes back to Jaime's question about structural reforms. What can we do really to stimulate job creation in the formal sector, taking people out of poverty? It's, not, it's going to depend less on the government. It has to depend more on the market. Right. 
Eric and Ricardo, last quick word. Yes, let me say something on, on poverty and I would add income distribution in some way. Uh, because macro resilience by itself is not the, the most important thing. It's not enough to have uh, financial stability or economic stability in your country if you don't share the wealth with everybody. And that's an important point because when you think about the structural reforms, I think countries should have, at least in Latin America, three priorities. Education, education, and education. And that's, I think, is the most important thing. And when you think about the structural reform, every country should have a big structural reform on education. But given that you have, and you are responsible fiscally, you should have also a tax reform. Right. Then given the, the criticism, we can talk about the details about that, but if you want to increase expenditures, you need to increase the resources. Right. And that's why it's important to match in some way or another with these two right. structural reforms. Right. Two, two quick comments. Uh, first, on the rule of law. Uh, I think Brazil has the biggest number of laws uh, among uh, ourselves in the, the continent. It's not a matter just of having the rule of law, it's a matter of, of enforcement, the, the rule of law. And we've seen that enforcement in, in Brazil lately, especially uh, after the corruption investigations, all spheres of the country, Supreme uh, Justice, uh, police, federal police, and so on. And it's a good sign that mature institutions are evolving that way. On the poverty, the government we see in the inclusion of um, middle class and reduction of uh, the base of the pyramid with the growth uh, and inclusion that Brazil and the, the region had given the positive tailwind effect. We've seen the Gini index also improving, but uh, we need to grow out of poverty. That's why those measures and those uh, investments are so important because I agree with Eric, you should, you must grow the pie. Uh, in order in, in to divide and not only distribute what you have there and we need to create the jobs and also uh, to give opportunity to people to be included in society. Actually, it's not enough to give social subsidies uh, to the poor having uh, aspiration for them to raise up in the pyramid or packages that they don't simply work. We must create incentives for people to find work, to get skills, to become entrepreneurs, to innovate, uh, to raise them from poverty. And that's cr critical to uh, persevere and at that moment in order to regain confidence and trust, we should have no tolerance or complacency. Right, well that's in the positive note on which to end. Thank you for a stimulating dis discussion. I won't try and summarize those very diverse different themes other than to say that clearly the tide, the current has changed whatever analogy you want to use. Um, swimming is going to be a lot harder over the next year, but best of luck in trying to find a good course, um, whatever policy clothes you're wearing. So thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.